Well, hello everyone. So I'm back again today working on the boost converter project. So today we're going to talk about thermal management and cooling of the power transistor. So in theory cooling the transistor is pretty straightforward. Really you just need to have anything that has a lower temperature than the temperature of the transistor itself. But in reality there's a few different problems that you need to account for. So the second law of thermodynamics is pretty clear. Energy always flows from an area of higher temperature to an area of lower temperature. So naturally, any area with a lower temperature can cool your transistor. However, you need to consider the actual physical package like this. There are chips inside of this, and between the chips and this part, the bottom of it, the base plate that connects to the heatsink, there's an insulating layer that electrically insulates it so there won't be any short circuits with the heatsink. But unfortunately, that creates thermal resistance. So thermal resistance really is anything that resists the flow of thermal energy. So you could probably draw a comparison to electrical resistance. Now with an electrical resistance, any resistance produces a voltage drop. But in a thermal difference or thermal resistance, it creates a difference in temperature. So basically, in a nutshell, what it all means is that inside of one of these, the transistor, the actual chips, the actual IGBTs that are doing the switching work, they're going to actually have to get a lot hotter than the base plate before they can dissipate any heat. And also, the heat sink that this is ultimately connected to, this base plate is going to have to be hotter than the heat sink in order for this to dissipate any thermal energy at all. And then finally, the heat sink itself is going to have to be warmer than the ambient air temperature. Or if it's a liquid cooled heat sink, it's actually going to have to be warmer than the liquid that's flowing through it in order for it to dissipate any heat. Otherwise, the, the heat's just going to stay trapped inside the module. Okay, so the thermal resistance that I was just talking about, about how there will be a thermal resistance between the chips and the base plate and between the base plate and the heat sink, that's usually actually listed in the IGBT's data sheet. So the first part is the RTH, that's the resistance between the junction and the case. And you can see it'll rise 0 0.063 degrees Celsius for every watt dissipated. And below that there's a the thermal resistance between the actual IGBT case and the heatsink. And that number is a lot higher. Also there's the same thing in this data sheet for the freewheeling diode. So the diode you don't need to worry too much about in this particular setup, but keep that in mind as well. Okay, bearing in mind the thermal resistance, you'll also see here that there is a maximum junction temperature. So basically that's the chip itself. And remember that the chip temperature isn't going to be necessarily reflected by the temperature of the case or the heat sink. So the maximum, the absolute maximum temperature, and this is true for most semiconductors, most power semiconductors I should say, the maximum chip temperature is actually 150 degrees Celsius. So keep that in mind that you're not actually going to be able to tell the temperature of the chip just by feeling the base plate or by reading the temperature of the heat sink. Now, now in order for you to be able to calculate accurately what the temperature rise is actually going to be, you need to start calculating how much power that, that your transistor is going to dissipate. So you can start by the saturation voltage and the collector's current multiplied by the pulse width. So this is just a data sheet value. This isn't going to be what we're going to see in the real world here. But if the current flowing through this particular transistor were 300 amps, then the saturation voltage would be 3 volts. And 3 volts times 300 amps would be 900 watts and then you'd multiply that by the duty cycle. However, the thing to consider is that the saturation voltage in a bipolar transistor like this one is dynamic. It's not linear like resistance. So as you can see from this particular graph, the collector to emitter saturation voltages at varying gate voltages with different collector currents. So from 20 and 15 volts it does look like it's linear but remember that this also changes with temperature. But you can see at the different gate voltages the 
saturation voltage isn't linear. It's actually quite dynamic. Now, of course, it is possible to calculate the switching energy from the information provided in the data sheet. But again, it's quite a dynamic it's, it's quite a dynamic loss. So it really is more than can be fit into one video. So once again, we're going to turn to a simulator for a little assistance. Okay, so the simulator that I'm using here is called MelcoSim. It's free, it's from Mitsubishi Electric, but you do have to go to their website and register before you can download it. So we're going to calculate using a very similarly sized transistor. This is a CM300DY-24A as the same current and voltage ratings as the one that we're going to use. So it's not going to be completely accurate, but it should be close enough to use. So the input voltage will go 24. The output voltage will do 340 like we said. And the output current will go ahead and do 3.5. And put 3 just to get it up to an even 50 amps. 500 hertz switching frequency. Now TS is your target heatsink temperature, which in this example is going to be quite high and the thermal junction you can't change. Again, the maximum temperature of that chip is going to be 150 degrees Celsius. So let's go ahead and see what the simulator tells us. So the total power lost here actually isn't enormous. It's only 62.82 watts. But I do want you to notice here the temperature of the case is 90.62 degrees Celsius and the actual junction temperature is 94.38. So it did calculate in, it calculated for us that temperature difference because of the thermal resistance and it also factored it in for the diode but as you can see like I said that's not going to be as much of an issue. There's only 1.3 degrees difference there compared to 4.3 degrees difference for the actual transistor. And remember this is with a heat sink temperature of 90 degrees Celsius. So even if our heat sink were 90 degrees Celsius, which, which is pretty hot, we, we, we would still be okay. We'd still have plenty of room left over before the chips actually reached 150 degrees Celsius. Okay, just in case you were curious, this is the address that you need to go to if you do want to get Melcosim, but again, you do have to register before you can actually download the software. Okay, so the next part really should be pretty self-explanatory. What you really want to do is mount your transistor and your diode onto the heat sink, turn it on and load it up, and measure the temperature. Now the simulator said that it was okay even if we got up to 90 degrees Celsius on the heat sink, which is pretty hot. But in reality, guys, I'd say if your heat sink is getting up to around 60 or 70 Celsius, that's a little bit hot for my taste. But we're going to test it out, and I have the resistors up on the old juice cans because this time they're going to get quite hot. So we are going to go for a higher power test here than last time. And of course we are going to check on the turnoff spike and make sure we aren't going too high there. Okay, so once again this is the output voltage and the resistors there that's 25 ohms and it is going to be quite loud and yes I still may change the switching frequency later that'll probably be in another video so mind your volume and here we go Inductor's current is 53 amps, and we're getting 176 volts out. And we're turning down. So basically, in your setup, you just need to run it continuously. I'm not going to do that now because the batteries, I think, are a little bit undersized to be doing that. But run it continuously and measure the temperature of your heat sink. And if the temperature of the heat sink is starting to go too high, it's starting to creep up around 60 and 70 Celsius, then you might want to consider getting a bigger one or used force cooling or liquid cooling or something like that. Okay, now we're going to check the turnoff spike. 
Now this is 50 volts per square there per grid division. We're going to go ahead and crank it up and see what we get. That's a pretty big one. Trigger it a little bit here. I guess it's not too bad, is it? Okay, just a couple of things before I forget. Whatever transistor you choose to use and whatever heatsink you choose to use, you do need some sort of thermal interface material. For this one, we use an Arctic Silver 5. Yeah, it is kind of expensive, to be honest with you, but it does work pretty well. And if it wasn't obvious from the meters in that last test, we were running from 24 volts DC. So, in that test there, I think we did reach our goal. And I said I wanted it to be able to do 1.2 kilowatts, so we had 175 volts and 25 ohms, so yeah, looking pretty good. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. So the next video is probably going to be the project being finalized and finished. The only thing really left to do is we need to get some power supplies to go from the 24 volts DC input and they need to provide isolated power to run the gate driver and the pulse width modulator. So that'll probably be next video. I thank you guys for watching and if you have any questions or comment, I'll be up here. You can reach me on YouTube or email me, send a comment, message or whatever. Thanks for watching guys and I'll see you next time.